Thank you for the invitation to, to be in this uh, event. Uh, my group has been focusing the last 15 years in, in, the, in the identification of endogenous factors, mainly neuropeptides and hormones that are involved in the regulation of the immune system for, to propose treatment inflammation and autoimmunity. So uh, I think that we can find some opportunities with this neuropeptide and it's something that we are going to discuss at the, at the end. But I would like to start with this, the picture of this uh, lady, the American activist uh, uh, Helen Keller, who proposed at the beginning of the last century that the highest result of education is, is tolerance. It's obvious that to maintain the uh, actual structure of obscurity, we had to uh, apply this concept. From a neurological point of view, it's even more important for our survival, because as probably you know, the immune system has done the job to protect against a wide array of pathogens, but at the same time, can, uh, the immune system has to keep the tolerance against our tissue. And it, it, this is not easy because the immune system is perfectly designed to localize and neutralize and eliminate uh, antigens, pathogens, etc. So in normal conditions, the pathogen enters in your body and the immune cell, the innate immune cell, neutralizes the, 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 the pathogen through a concept that is called in inflammatory regulation. Uh, in most of the conditions, uh, the pathogen is also taken by antigen presenting cell to mount one T cell response, adaptive uh, response against the pathogen and create memory for a second infection. So that's fine with the production with antibodies, et cetera. So, but in some conditions, some part of the pathogen looks of, of uh, antigens. This is the self-antigen. In that case, the, ant the immune system don't distinguish between the pathogen and our cells. In other conditions, after chronic inflammation, new antigens appear after the tissue destruction. And this is the concept of new self antigens. So uh, the problem is that the immune system is going to recognize equally the pathogen and the self antigen. And this is, this is very frequent because if we have that in, in a, if you take into account that we can generate 10 to 14 different T cell clones that we are protected for everything in, in the nature, 50% of the, these clones can recognize self antigens. Okay? And luckily for us, we have mechanisms of tolerance, mainly this, during the education in the thymus, most of the uh, uh, clones, T cells that recognize the self antigen are eliminated, but to not compromise too much our immune system has to leave some uh, clones, some T cells that partially recognize pathogens and uh, self antigen, and this is the clone cell selection. So we have to have a mechanism of uh, peripheral tolerance in our body, because in half we have in our body uh, circulating self reactive uh, antigens, uh, T cell, I'm sorry. Okay. Here are some of the mechanisms that our uh, immune system used to control the self reactive T cell. Probably one of the, or the most important uh, mechanism is the induction of T-REC that this morning has uh, everybody talking about these cells. So what happens when we lose the tolerance against uh, our uh, antigens? The consequence is the autoimmunity, okay? Probably it's the evolutionary price to be covered uh, against a lot of, of uh, pathogens. But this is the case of multiple sclerosis, but this is similar for most of the autoimmune disease. The scenario is different, but the actors are the same. Again, the pathogen, taken by antigen presenting cell, the presentation to this uh, antigen to T cell, the proliferation of mainly this kind of cell, autoreactive cell, producing t one and t 17 cytokines, activation of uh, uh, B cells and production of autoantibodies that all of them can enter in the target tissue. In this case, it's uh, the uh, central nervous system and a uh, self attack against uh, uh, old tissues. Uh, the activation of resistant cells, in this case, macroglia, can contribute to this uh, destruction. So luckily for us, we have cells, this is a direct, that are patrolling our body and act as blue helms or uh, polys that control this activation and differentiation of uh, uh, autoreactive T cells. But in some cases, genetic environment made that some of these uh, uh, mechanisms of tolerance uh, fall. Uh, and 
10% of us in this room are going to present, uh, to suffer endocrine disease during our life. This is something that is uh, uh, recurrent. So in all autoimmune diseases, there is an imbalance between the HEPA1 and the HEPA17 cells against the regulatory cells, pro-inflammatory environment versus anti-inflammatory environment. Okay? So what we are looking uh, in the immunology field is just change this situation of autoimmunity to homeostasis balance. We don't have to reverse totally this, this effect. Uh, we only want to balance again this this, uh, uh, this situation. So we are looking for this gold fa uh, golden factor in, in autoimmunity. So it's obvious that we can think that because this is critical for the homeostasis of the immune system, immune factor, mainly in cytokines, everybody's uh, focusing in, in cytokines, should be involved in this balance. We have pursued this, this, uh, this thing by following a different strategy. So our strategy is based in this concept we know that the brain and the immune system is communicated. There is a bidirectional communication between both systems. Uh, Dr. Perry has nicely presented that infection or inflammation in the periphery can affect the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, behavior, fever, etc. This is something that is totally established. And at the, the contrary, a stressor, physical and psychological, can affect the immune, or immune system. So our immune system is is exposed to the, uh, our brain the responses. So here we have the glucocorticoids that you know that are one of the most important of potent and inflammatory factors. So the important thing here in, in, our, in, uh, in our system is that both systems speak the same biochemical language. That means that here we have the neuropeptide. This is all star in the, in the, in the, in the laboratory. The, this neuropeptide are peptide produced by the neurons but we have discovered that also the immune cells can produce neuropeptide, and the immune cells have receptor for neuropeptide. So this is the list of the neuropeptides that we have characterized in our lab. And you, you know this guy, the vasotintestinal peptide, because Don and Sonia present this morning. But these other neuropeptides have similar properties. And you see this sequence are the family that they belong they are totally different. They act through different receptors. The major roles in the body uh, are uh, more or less different, but they look different. But from an immunological point of view, they have common characteristics that are attractive for autoimmunity. They're produced by the immune cells in response to inflammation and autoimmunity. Uh, the immune cells express a specific receptor. And probably the most important thing is that all these receptors are coupled to CMP and PK signaling that is a traditional pathway that is related with anti-inflammation and immunosuppression. In fact, I would like to call this neuropeptide as neuropeptide because this neuropeptide acting like, uh, like uh, uh, cytokines. So uh, trying to summarize a lot of work, independently of the, of the source of this neuropeptide, blood uh, coming from the blood or the cell or administration nerve or from the you know, lymph uh, cell, uh, the presence of the neuropet uh, these neuropeptides are going to do two major uh, functions in the immune system. Uh, it's going, they are going to deactivate microglia and macrophages to produce a wide array of inflammatory mediators, chemokines, toxic factors like nucleoside, PG2, etc. At the same time, can induce anti-inflammatory factors like I10, inhibit the clonal expansion, expansion of autoreactive uh, cells through different mechanisms. At the same way, uh, this neuropathic can inhibit the antigen presentation to T cells, inhibiting mainly the differentiation of the HLP1 cells that you know that is related with autoimmunity and uh, inflammation. And uh, partially can forward the, the HLP2, but not in all the cases. Another important thing is that the presence of the neuropeptide in this uh, environment is going, they are going to uh, induce the, uh, the emergence of uh, regulatory T cells. And you know that it's important to maintain uh, uh, tolerance and also can induce other cells that collaborate with this system. So in the presence of the neuropeptide, we are changing this, this uh, uh, previous environment, favoring the, the anti-inflammatory uh, 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 environment and promoting regulatory T cells and partially T-HEPA2 cells and reducing T-HEPA1 and T-HEPA17 cells. So 
with, with this scenario, you can imagine that everybody has tried to, to use this neuropeptide in different uh, uh, autoimmune and inflammatory disease. Uh, we have used previously in animal model, that is the preclinical uh, pre uh, uh, strategy that we use. This is the list of the uh, animal model that this neuropeptide, mainly the BAP, has been proved that is effective. We have a sepsis, a inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoiditis, pancreatitis, etc., etc. Also, neuroinflammatory diseases, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's after trauma, etc. You have here some examples of, of this. I would like to mention only three or four examples just to have an idea of, of the uh, potency of this neuropeptide. So this is one model of uh, brain trauma that is caused by uh, uh, inducing trauma in one area of the, of the brain. This is the, in this corner is the, where we insert the pipette to, uh, to make the lesion of the, of the, of the, in the brain. And you can see here that there is a huge uh, neurodegeneration, as Dr. Perry explained, due to uh, 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 inflammation. You can see here that there is a huge activation of microglia with production of an uh, inflammatory mediator or recruitment of, inf uh, of immune cells to this site. The injection of VIP after the trauma, you can see that here, that we can prevent the neurodegeneration. This is because VIP can inhibit the activation of uh, microglia and recruitment of, of inflammatory cells to the site of injury. If we move to a uh, model that is more autoimmunity and inf inflammatory with an inflammatory component like uh, this uh, model of Crohn's disease, that is induced after the inject injection of this uh, compound, the MBS. You can see here that after the injection in mouse, you see one decrease in the body weight. This is caused because there is a severe colitis in these in this, uh, animals. Uh, uh, a majority of them die by this colitis because there is perforation of, uh, of the intestine, uh, etc. You can see here that is a huge inflammation necrosis in the, in the colon of this, uh, of this uh, mice. The injection of Neuropeptide in that case, we have, I have put an example of ghrelin, but it's similar for the rest of the neuropeptide. Prevent this body weight loss, prevent the mortality, and this is because prevent the inflammation in the, in the, in the gut and the destruction of the mucosa. Okay. Okay, the, probably one of the most important things is that we can inject the, the, the neuropeptide once the disease is established with a chronic uh, disease. We can reestablish the, the uh, occur the disease after uh, the disease is established. And another important thing is that if you inject the neuropathy just in the beginning and not later, this, uh, uh, this initial injection of the neuropathy resists or tolerates a second injection of TMBS. You can see here that the controls animals without treatment, all the animals die by the colitis after the second administration of the TMBS. However, the animals that were initially treated with neuropathy resist this second injection of TMBS. And from a therapeutic point of view, this is important because we can treat uh, patients that with established disease and we, a single administration in the beginning could resist a second uh, uh, peak of the disease. If we move to another model, this is a model of rheumatoarthritis induced by collagen uh, 2. You can see here that all the animals that are untreated suffer different uh, uh, clinical scores of disease that is characterized by the typical inflammation in the joints uh, in both uh, paws and destruction of inflammation in the, in, the, in the joint, destruction of the bone, totally disappearing of the cartilage, etc. The injection of BIP, of, in, this, in that case BIP, at that point, a single administration of fat days, you can see here that we can inhibit the progression of disease. The poles are totally different to, to this. And the histological levels, there is a preservation of, of, the, of, the, of the joint. Okay. Finally, if we move to a more neurological uh, uh, disease, but with a potent uh, component of the immune disease, the uh, multiple sclerosis. This is the preclinical uh, model that we use, uh, we typically use, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Again, in mice that are susceptible, uh, we inject one autoantigen, and we can generate different peaks of, uh, of uh, paralysis. So this is uh, from zero to six, uh, there are different great, uh, uh, score for paralysis from uh, uh, paraplegia, uh, tetraplegia, etc. Uh, this paralysis is because uh, there is a complete demyelinization of, of the spinal cord. This area is totally uh, ascent of blue. This is myelin. 
uh, there is a loss in oligodendrocytes that are the cells that are uh, forming the, uh, the nerves, uh, axonal damage, and this is because there is a huge infiltration of uh, T cells and macrophages in this, in this uh, area. The injection of VIP in the beginning or in one of uh, the maximum peak of the disease during five days, you can see here that we can prevent the relapsing of the disease. And this is because we can prevent the immunization, uh, improve the number of, uh, of ligodendrocytes, uh, avoid the axonal damage. And this is mainly because we can inhibit the infiltration of inflammatory cells in the, in the brain parenchyma. Okay, this same video that just to show this, but uh, for technical problem we cannot show, but the concept is that these mice that are treated in this point, this is like to be in this situation, after the treatment with cortistatin, you can see that the mice can work perfectly, okay? Uh, the mechanisms are very simple, and we proposed previously in vitro. One component is the inflammation, and you can see here that in mice that have the disease, uh, they have a, a panel of inflammatory mediators in the spinal cord. This is typical of, of, of the disease. Chemokines that recruit most cells. When you treat this animal with, uh, with BIP, there is a reaction of inflammatory response, the reaction of uh, uh, chemokines, and induction again of anti-inflammatory uh, uh, mediators. If you see the other component of the disease, that is the uh, auto-reactive component. This is the mediated with T cells, the HP1 cells. You take these animals that were treated or not with BIP, and you take the draining lymph node, that is where something is uh, initially happens, and this could promote the autoimmune response, and you stimulate with the autoantigen. You can see here, here that in the control with the treatment, these cells proliferate. That means that they are auto-reactive T-cell, self-reactive uh, T-cells. They produce the typical response of T-helper-1, and you see the number of autoantibodies in the, in, the, in the serum. You can see here that there is a huge number of autoantibodies, mainly this kind of autoantibodies that are typical of the helper one response. Animal treated with BIP, they don't have auto cells, they don't produce the helper one uh, cytokines and reduce the number of, of autoantibodies in the, in the serum. The third component that is important is the induction of regulatory T cells. And as you can see here, that after the administration of BIP, we can induce more uh, cell that is pressed for uh, CD4, uh, CD25, other marker of regulatory T cells. And in the brain parenchyma, you can see here around one vessel that in the control that huge infiltration of CD4, not with BIP, and BIP induced the appearance of, of uh, force P3 regulatory T cells. This is something that is probably happening or initiated in the periphery because CD40 cells from uh, lymph node have the same profile. BIP induced the appearance of the emergency of these of this regulatory T cells in the, in the, uh, in the lymph node. So in summary, in this part, we can see here that the, the treatment of neuropathy is going to uh, inhibit the differentiation or proliferation of, of uh, t helper one cell autoreactive T cell. Indirectly, we can inhibit the formation or the production of autoantibodies, mainly antibodies that fix complement. And the neuropathy can also inhibit the activation of resident microglia and infiltrated macrophages. And at the same time, that is important to keep uh, or to maintain the, the tolerance induce the emergency of uh, the generation of regulatory T cell that antigen specific and help to this uh, inhibition. Okay, uh, so probably we are uh, in front of um, one of the few factors that can convert this, uh, this uh, situation to this other situation. And uh, we have, still we have different questions. Uh, why is from a physiological point of view, we need one healthy neuropeptide system to be healthy. In other words, if we have one uh, mistake in this system, we are more susceptible to suffer uh, these diseases. The second question is that we are ready for the clinic. This is animal model, but you know that it's totally different to, to the human. And probably the most important for you, we have any chance in, uh, in ME and CSF. So the answer for the first question is, Yes, if we have alter or neuropeptide system, we are more susceptible to suffer disease. The first evidence came from animals model. This is only samples with BIP, but we have other samples with the rest of the neuropeptide. Uh, animals that were genetically defect, defect, uh, deficient in BIP, 
they are more susceptible to suffer sepsis, lung disease, and multiple sclerosis. But if you move to, to human, the situation is the same. Patients with multiple sclerosis, they have an alteration in the expression of BAP receptor, a decrease, and this is related with aberrant uh, T helper 1 uh, immunity. Uh, patients with lupus or autoimmune uh, thyroiditis, they have a huge amount of BPase autoantibodies that they, uh, decrease the number of uh, the levels of BAP in these patients. And uh, we have also demonstrated that in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, there is a decrease in the expression of, of BPAC, uh, BPAC1 receptor in, in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And probably this is the first data that demonstrates that it's linked to a genetic predisposition because we have found one genetic polymorphins and a targeting for microRNA in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, receptor. Uh, the second question we are ready for the clinic. So, for example, in the case of BAP, BAP exists uh, in the in the clinic, the market with the name of Abitadil. Of course, for the market is very inter the pharmaceutical company are very interested in erectile dysfunction. So this is the first application for BAP that will enter in the market. All, the, all of this is uh, anti uh, pre -clinic, uh, clinical trials in idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, sepsis and sarcoidosis, treating different components of disease. I'm going to show some data about sarcoidosis because this is the, 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 the work that we uh, participated uh, previously. The sarcoidosis is one systemic disease that is caused by one unknown infective uh, factor, uh, probably one virus. Uh, mainly it affects the, the lung because it's uh, characterized by the formation of granuloma. And the characteristic for any medical point of view is that there is an increase in TNF alpha, T helpo 1, and decrease in T regulatory T cells. So the typical autoimmune response. In that case, we have used 20 patients. Uh, the patients uh, self administrate the, the, uh, the uh, BAP by inhalation during four weeks. And this is our, 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 the result. There is one reduction in the uh, levels of TNF alpha in the bronchoalveolar larynx. So this is where. The, the inflammation is occurring. The most important thing is that these five, six patients that are with a very severe disease uh, and with a compromised uh, survival decrease uh, drastically the, the levels of, of, of TNF alpha after the injection of anti inhalation of BAP. Other factor inflammatory response is also uh, 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 decreases. One other important thing is this first study in the world that demonstrated that we can increase in human uh, regulatory T cell with one treatment is after the treatment with, with, uh, with BIP, we can increase the number of regulatory T cells in the, in the lung from very low to high levels of, of, regulatory, uh, of regulatory T cell. This is important if you take into account that this is our normal number of regulatory T cells in our lung. This is in healthy condition. In sarcoidosis, in chronic active, there is a huge reduction of this. And then, for example, uh, uh, patient that spontaneous remit or with not active, there is a recovery in the neurovatory T cell. And this explains why we have found this reduction in TNF alpha and increase in the quality of life of this patient with after inhalation of, of BAP. What happened with the, uh, the ME? So we have any chance with BAP or with the resonant neuropeptide. So this is the symptom that the physician used to uh, that diagnosis of, of this, the symptom that uh, occurs in, in the physical, cognitive, and nervous system uh, disorder. Uh, Dan has partially explained this. In addition to the anti-inflammatory effect and induction of immune tolerance, if we take into account that probably the M is out on, out in, uh, uh, immune or auto-inflammatory disease, this is, could prevent or restore this unbalance in, in, in this disease. Uh, there are other uh, uh, function of this neuropeptide that can contribute to ameliorate these this symptoms. Uh, uh, Don Stein has comment all of them. Probably the only thing that he has not comment is the antimicrobial activity that uh, this neuropeptide has uh, been demonstrated that can physically interact with bacteria, not still with uh, uh, virus, but bacteria and parasite, and kill directly these this, uh, pathogens. Another important thing that related with the previous. Uh, 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 previous uh, toll is analgesia. At least with cortistatin, uh, we have found that uh, uh, attenuated uh, hyperalgesia and allodynia in inflammatory, or the most important thing is in neuropathic uh, uh, conditions. Okay. 
just let me show you two examples of how we can enter in the, in the uh, ME uh, disease with this neuropathy with BAP. This is one study made by uh, Richard Schoemaker in Maryland, uh, focusing in patients with uh, chronic fatigue that was caused by exposure to cigatera. He didn't know what is cigatera, but he told me that cigatera is the most common main uh, uh, person in the world life that is you, uh, uh, you acquired in the, in the, in the fish in the food, okay? And this is prevalence in Caribbean countries, okay? The important thing and the curious is that you see the symptoms that these guys uh, describe in, in the, uh, 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 to reach is, they are very similar to uh, ME, CSF. Almost all of them, they have fatigue, and this is the number of patients that describe the rest of the symptoms in comparison with controls. It's a huge difference between this, but you are very familiar with this sign. They look ME. They try to compare different biomar biomarkers, what is wrong in these in this patterns, and they measure different things. The curious thing is that they found that two neuropeptide, BIP, and the melanocyte stimulating factor, uh, that is also anti inflammatory, they are hugely uh, uh, reduced in this pattern in comparison with control. In addition, all the factors that TG beta complement, et cetera, they are increased. So there is a uh, uh, difference uh, very clear. So in fact, they compare case with uh, controls, and they found that, for example, for BAP, 96% of the, the patients have the deficiency of BAP, the controls, none of them, and uh, also for example with M MSH. The, on the contrary, the increase in the other inflammatory factors are also related with the disease. So it's for, probably the first evidence that one deficiency in BAP is related with one fatigue-related uh, disease. Following the same uh, strategy, uh, they have choose another uh, group of patients that suffer uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome as well as following exposure to water damage uh, buildings. Again, the symptoms are the same, and you compare here the number of symptoms you can see here that the control, they describe around, around three uh, symptoms of media in comparison with the, this uh, patterns with this syndrome that describe at least more than 20 symptoms different in this, in this uh, disease. Again, BAP and uh, MSH uh, are decreasing this pattern. 98% of the, of the, of the patterns describe one deficiency in BAP. So this look that is common with this kind of mm, fatigue-related uh, uh, diseases, and they have made one clinical trial. You, we have to take in account that it's only uh, one uh, clinical trial is open label with a placebo in only 20 patterns, okay? Uh, again, they choose the inhalation of BAP because you can do it yourself uh, during uh, 18 months, four times, uh, uh, 50 micrograms of, of BAP every time. So this is the different uh, uh, score that they have uh, uh, measured. This is the symptoms, again, the control around three. Uh, in the baseline before the BAP treatment, around 30 different symptoms per uh, patient. After the treatment with, with BAP, reduction of five or after 12 months, close to the control. The, they recover partially the, the, number, the levels of BAP and uh, MSH and restore the rest of the inflammatory mediator. Okay. In summary, they send me this, uh, this uh, 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 paragraph. Uh, the trial show with that BAP treated safely, that is important. Reduce the symptom of equal to, to control. Remarkable symptoms improvement and correction of chronic fatigue, shortness of breath and asthma-like condition, executive cognitive de deficit neurologic symptoms, and chronic joint pain. Correct all inflammatory and hormonal parameters that they measure. Normalize the pulmonary artery systolic pressure during exercise. Normalize number of regulatory T cells, and probably the most important thing, all the patients increase the, high, the quality of life in this, in this uh, uh, trial. So just to take uh, this message at home, if it is true that the higher result of indication is tolerance, non-classical immune factor like neuropeptides definitely contribute to educate our immune system to be more tolerant. And just 
thanks the people that have collaborated with, with this, the real VIP people, uh, my group in, in, in Granada, all, all the collaborators, and of course the, pe the people that put the money that, to do this kind of experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, why pain specialists don't seem to equate ME with serious neurological pain and whether the pain in ME presents differently from other illnesses? Is the first part of that true in your opinion? Well, <clears throat> I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, I'm a scientist. Um, uh, and, but, I, but I know a lot of, of pain specialists. I mean, my, my impression is those kinds of pain specialists that are genuinely interested in pain would not discount it and not uh, react in this way. And perhaps what you need to do is to ask your GP to be referred to a really good pain clinic, so as opposed to just um, a neurologist. Um, and there are very good pain clinics in specific places in the UK. And if you go to the uh, website of the British Pain Society, which is an organisation which is um, entirely devoted to the treatment of pain, there you will uh, see where the main uh, pain clinics in the UK are. So I think it's just a question of finding right. specialists. I don't want to hog this with pain, but we could maybe get one other question in before you cross question. Yes, is it about pain? Is it about pain? I'd rather have one about pain, because I have a whole series of questions. Uh, I've got three questions. Uh, 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 how am I going to choose? The shut my <laughs> or the middle man. OK. I like middle men. Yeah. Go on. Uh, there's a type of pain prevalent in MECFS, which Maria didn't cover. If I, I try and give an example. Yeah, if can I you turn, turn to it? If I tense my, sh my, shout, shout my arm and shoulder like this, like I'm going to strike you, which I have no intention of doing, then after a minute or so, I will have pain because of all this tension. Yes. But I can relax it. Now, people with ME, for example, my wife, all these muscles in my shoulder and arm are overlapping. My wife and other people can get a pain in just one of those muscles, a very sharp pain. And it's, you can't relax. And I can feel that particular muscle, and it's hard. Is, the, is your point that the pain is different? The, the, the thing is that the muscle, I can tense a group of muscles. Yes. These are muscles where only one is in tension prolonged tension, intention and cannot be relaxed. Right. So, I mean, I can't, I can't pretend to be able to answer this question about, about your wife, but, but, but I w did try and explain that pain does not only have a sensory component, there's a very strong motor component to pain, and, and, and you, you know that from just sort of classic nociceptive reflexes. If you touch something, you, you tense the muscles in order to withdraw from that area. So... Um, what I wanted to try and emphasise is that there's um, a dysregulation in the pain process. And evidently what's happening to your wife is that the, the, the flexor muscle that would be involved in kind of the movement side of pain has got kind of stuck, if you like, in a totally flexed... Um, and so it, it's an example of this amplification. Why it is it's only one muscle as, uh, of a group... Um, obviously, I don't know, but I think it's important to to understand that 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 muscle movement and the sensory the sensation of pain are intimately related to one another. So it's not it's not odd in itself that it should be related to the muscle tension. Okay, I'll take one more on pain, and in fairness to the other speakers, I'm going to move on to other questions to give. So you, I know they don't want any questions. We'll let you go. Microphone. Uh, Gunnar Olsson from Sweden. A question to Mariah. You're talking about uh, uh, sensitization of nociceptors, uh, nociceptor neurons in fibromyalgia. Um, I question a little bit of, uh, is it really a sensitization out in the periphery? You know, the nociceptive uh, nerve endings is very high thresholds. 
you need a hard stimulation to get a signal from them if it's not uh, inflammation. Inflammation makes the threshold dramatically go down. This explains the primary hyperalgesia, why it's so hot uh, in a wound, so um, <clears throat> uh, painful to touch it. Uh, my question, could there be another explanation? You know, in a fibromyalgia, uh, you have a spontaneous, um, continuous spontaneous pain, and with a quite light touch to a muscle, a light pressure, you elicit pain. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's no sensitization by inflammation, I don't believe that, that this is a nociceptive flow you start then. It must be other sensory modalities that perhaps in the spinal cord get into the secondary nociceptive neurons, then giving pain, with a mechanism very similar to uh, secondary hyperalgesia that is uh, uh, transmitting in touch fibers. If, it's, uh, if this would be possible, then the pain actually uh, from the muscle is not a nociceptive inflow. Could it be like that? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that it had to be sensitization of nociceptors. I, I simply wanted to illustrate the work of John Levine, who, who, who has suggested that. But, but I agree with you. I think it's much more likely to be central. And in fact, the circuitry um, of the spinal cord um, the same neurons can receive input from tactile low threshold inputs as from nociceptive inputs. And this kind of wind up that I was talking about, this central sensitization, which I know you know about, um, would, would allow exactly that. That what would normally be um, an innocuous, painless um, sensation becomes painful because those neurons are now much more kind of wound up, if you like, and more easy to sensitize. So, yeah, and personally, I think it's much more likely to be sensitized. Yeah, but this is not the, f the primary um, uh, nociceptive neuron. It's probably the, the secondary. Exactly, yeah. yes, in the yeah. central nervous system, yeah. Let's have some uh, questions for the other two speakers. Yes, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Um, it's a question for you, Perry. It's many of uh, MECSF patients I come across clinically have uh, usually a body core temperature which is um, about one degree less lower than normal uh, human being. Does uh, you, Perry, believe this to be a cause or effect with chronic fatigue or any information would be welcome? I think, as in so many of these things, the honest answer is I have no idea. Um, uh, it would be interesting to know whether this was true of all patient population, whether patients or whether the subgroups and so forth, whether they have different processing in pathways or molecules known to induce changes in fever and so forth. Uh, you can imagine it, that one could, one could design a series of experiments that would investigate that regulation of core temperature. But it's first, is it the same in, in a large group? Is it falling into different subgroups and so forth? Uh, but I can't give you an explanation. OK. Anyone else? Yes, sorry. You need to get microphone down here, Pierre, please. On one there, OK. You start first, please. Um, yeah, this is a question for Professor Hugh Perry. Um, I'm aware that Southampton University have recently uh, started a trial of perispinal antenoseps for Alzheimer's disease, is that correct? Yes. Uh, let, let me tell you the story briefly. Um, a tanocept is an inhibitor of TNF, and it was proposed by uh, Tobinick in, in the United States that if this inhibitor of TNF was delivered into the perispinal drainage, that this would have dramatic effects on people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, as far as I'm aware, most people don't believe that for a nanosecond um, because the perispinal drainage is the same as just delivering it actually into the circulation. Uh, what is true is we have a, a, a clinical trial. Uh, uh, Clive Holmes is recruiting patients for a clinical trial to give systemic etanocept to inhibit TNF because of the data that we showed in this population with Alzheimer's disease. There was an accelerated decline. Okay. In the Tominic studies, 
people were showing me to get out of chairs and jump around and all sorts mm. of rather strange ways. Yeah. So it's slightly different circumstance. But we would suggest, and, and we know, that in people, for example, with rheumatoid arthritis who've been treated with uh, the TNF inhibitors, um, their risk of getting Alzheimer's disease is much reduced by as much as even 40% uh, in a recent report. So people who've given TNF inhibitor, the TNF inhibitor rheumatoid, uh, not only feel better, but actually they're protected in some way from okay. potential onset. And just one other thing. Do you um, see a role for um, NFKB inhibitors in neurological disease? Because that can impact the you know, expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and IL-6, etc. So, as you're aware, no doubt, that the, the blood-brain barrier is still an enormous hurdle for studies in, in interventions in neurological disease, for, for drugs to get across the blood-brain barrier. And the trouble with, with things for the, that you want to attack uh, NF-kappa B, it also has to be intracellular. So whatever your drug is going to be, uh, and I've, maybe you've designed one and got one hidden away in your biotech company in your garage, um, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier, it then has to cross the plasma membrane, and then has to find the right target. So it, it would be a difficult target, and it would be a very broad target too, so there would be concerns about that too. One here. Room for another question after this. My question relates to yours and yours, and they're both Maria and Hugh. Hugh, you were talking about the activation of the microglia. You, Maria, were talking about the activation of the limbic system and the anterior insular basal ganglia with fibro. Now, in 2005, some research came out which showed that streptococcal infections affect the basal ganglia and cause a form of ADHD and a form of Tourette syndrome. Could a streptococcal infection be the thing that sets off, that activates microglia, and then we can end up with the fibro pain? The, the strep story is, is an extremely uh, interesting story. A, a lady called Swedo um, invested an enormous amount of energy in it uh, looking at uh, the impact of the initiation, if you like, of an autoimmune disease by strep infections. And uh, I went to a workshop now some time ago showing that uh, there was an association between strep infections and Tourette's and a number of other obsessive compulsive disorders uh, in these children who had had strep infections. Um, there is some evidence that uh, in people who've had a strep infection that this gives rise to antibodies uh, that can bind to particular targets in uh, the basal ganglia, and as Russell Dale's been involved in it, uh, this lady Swedo, uh, a number of other groups. Uh, I think what it does is it demonstrates a principle, I think, rather than uh, an explanation. Um, it demonstrates a principle that infection can give rise to immune response. The immune response can then have, uh, as was described earlier by uh, Don, molecular mim mimicry that then interferes with some aspect of nervous system function, and there are a number of examples of this. Whether this could be a component of uh, CFS, I think is, of course... You know, the, the stories you've heard this morning, uh, this idea that systemic events can change the levels of regulation and so forth, both the innate immune system uh, and the nervous system uh, later on in life is clearly a very interesting concept. How to design clever experiments, both either preclinically or clinically, to address this is really the key thing. So it's not about whether one believes something or not. We can believe lots of things that the central nervous system is an unbelievably complicated place to be doing any experimental work. And uh, what we need to do is design really clever experiments that we think are watertight, that will not just confirm our prejudices, but address a clear hypothesis. Would it be sensible if we started asking all the parents of the children that are getting it, if they're noticing a streptococcal infection okay. in the year prior to the onset? There are an enormous number of problems with those sorts of studies because, of course, uh, people recall the sorts mm. of things that they want to recall. Mm. And the best example of this, and I hate to almost bring it up, are the, the MMR vaccines, the relationship between MMR vaccine and autism. And having been involved with this and, and been, seen some of the children, I mean, you know, wonderful, beautiful child who's two years old mm. develops a really horrible disease. 
And what does the parent remember? The parent remembers that they were vaccinated by yeah. that wretched GP yeah. down the road yeah. within the last few weeks. And so this, this recall led to this huge um, outpouring of grief and so forth that then led to uh, lots of antagonism to people being vaccinated with the MMR. Uh, and largely based on the idea, not just the studies performed that were reported in the, in the Lancet, but because of people's recall, in no small part reported. So you, know, you will recognize when you remember the things, you remember the nasty things that happened to you, and you tend to form associations. So that's why I think I and Maria and, and all of us would agree. What we need to do is design really smart experiments with input from the, the patients, the charities, and so forth, to do the smartest work we can. This is unbelievably complex. Interactions in the immune system and the nervous system, I can't think of any bit of biology that's going to be more complicated. So if we're going to do smart things and get insights, we have to work with people who have the disease and then design clever experiments, be they in mice or rats or, or even in people. But they have to be smart and they have to be watertight to answer specific hypotheses in intelligent ways. And I think that's the way forward. I think that's the sort of thing that... That is rather a, a good point to break off, actually, because I think that's the message of these absorbing talks this morning, which titillate us and make us think about other things that need to be done. And a lot's been done, but every experiment always generates three others in your head that need to be done. And, mm -hmm. and we're trying to get you to, to appreciate this and get involved in it, as you says. Everybody has to feel a part of it, or it's nothing. It must be everybody or nothing in science, I think, and understanding it and getting it done. There needs to be a good debate.